It is said the dragons are eternal. This is true. It is said that dragons mate for life. This is true. It is said that when a dragon is born, the whole world trembles with awe and terror. This is partially true. In the age of giants there existed a bountiful land, overflowing with life of every sort, ruled by a provincial dynasty of dragons known as the Kel Asuf, the Spirits of Solitude. Foremost among these powerful tyrant lizards was Cain, eldest scion of the clan's reigning patriarch, Tsar, and greatest of his generation, bar none. As the firstborn, Cain had exclusive right to choose his eventual mate once he'd passed the trials of adulthood, as per the oldest draconic customs. As he was a strong and handsome young specimen, apart from being the sole heir to his father's kingdom, meant that Cain could have had any female in the land he chose. But being the firstborn also meant he had been born with many predisposed rivals, and when he selected a fawn named Lulal to be his partner rather than one of his own kind was all the excuse his younger clutchmates needed to activate a conspiracy against him to steal his inheritance, his birthright, and his heritage. Tsar, however, being both an honorable beast and a savvy ruler, took his eldest son aside and told him, Your siblings plot against you, my son. They have seen your choice of bride as a stain upon our land and family, and there can be no reasoning with them. They plot to seize what is yours by right of birth, of rank, and of trial. Cain thought long and hard on his father's warning, and in the end composed a plan to deal with his traitorous kin once and for all. As open conflict within a clan was strictly forbidden under his father's law, Cain would need to employ his ingenuity, cunning, and resourceful cleverness to preserve his hold over that which he cherished most in the world. He would destroy them, one by one, but not by force, through inaction, by preying upon their individual vices, their vanity, their hubris, their self-righteousness, their hypocrisy. He would forge a weapon with which they would each slit their own throats. And so he set his plan into motion. He and his chosen partner were wedded in secret, in the ancient way under cover of night, with naught but the stars and gods for witnesses. Then they got to work. In the fires of love and ambition, they wrought a creature alike nothing seen in the universe before, a powerful being of impressive stature and might, but also possessed of an infinite subtlety and savage brutality, all befitting his Maker's purpose as well as his own. They taught their firstborn everything they knew, all about the world, how it worked, how it spun, about the wider cosmos and how their far yon infinite complexities initiated and incubated actions down on the regional scale, and vice versa. They taught him science, religion, art, alchemy, history, geography, metaphysics, diplomacy, and when they were through, when their son had absorbed all the knowledge that his parents had to offer, they turned their new forged creation over to Tsar for final induction into the draconic art of war. And so, one hundred years hence his birth, Varkalak Dashin Zarender, better known in future legends as the Slayer of Ten, began on his life's inspired quest, that great work which he had been born and bred and trained to perform, to secure his own future dominion by systematically eliminating his ancestral rivals. This he did with an alacrity that alarmed even his parents. His every move and every consequence thereof was expertly calculated. His every ploy, every maneuver, every plot, every scheme and strategy and tactic was so thoroughly and tenaciously thought out and executed that eventually his targets grouped up in an attempt to seize an advantage by sheer force of arms. This did not work, for it too had been anticipated and stage-managed to perfection. Thus the first fireborn took the heads of his grandsire's nine flailing progeny with ruthless effort, and it is said that he claimed a prize from each and every one as trophies and as tokens of his general superiority to his elder kin. The now juth or nine lies, these would later be called, for they were nine and they were thus. Sue, from his father's nearest sibling he stole a single fang, from which he forged a dagger whose hilt he carved in the likeness of his father in honor of his own greater martial prowess. Sith. From the next born he took ten claws, 
which he fashioned into twin gauntlets, symbolizing his greater courage and ferocity. Nemesis. From the third, he stole the makings of wings and made them into an unassuming cloak, taking it as a symbol of his higher ambitions and vaster intellect. Vorpa. Fourth, he took a single bone, from which he fashioned a sword of surpassing sharpness and heft, whose blade he patterned with floral vines, and whose pommel he carved in the likeness of his mother, brandishing it in honor of his greater foresight, cunning, and wisdom. Lobo. Fifth, he stole his target's own face, sheathing its portion of skull in a house of alchemically automatic necromium, and from this fashioning a mask symbolizing his absolute mastery over all the arts of both life and death. Vulcan. From the sixth he obtained a coat of impregnable scales, from which he fashioned a suit of adamantine armor, symbolizing his invulnerability. Lucian. Seventh, he tore a strand of sinuous fiber from his fallen elder's tail. With it, he wove an unbreakable whip to symbolize his superior tact and guile. Urmagans. Eighth, he won a prized horn from the defeated arch-echelon commander. This he enchanted to spew unending torrents of ethereal fire upon the wielder's will. He'd called this proof of his absolute authority over mind, matter, and over the very forces of nature itself. Shormunjaba, ninth, he surgically extricated his final target's atlas vertebra, from which he made a pair of goblets, one for himself, the other for his own chosen wife, to thoroughly proclaim his abjectly advanced nature over those of his more bestial patrilineal kindred. Less than a decade after first embarking upon his Urlog saga, his fell deed was nearly complete, with merely one more head left to claim before his and his by now heavily pregnant partner's fortunes could be fully assured, for by now the young fireborn had grown to despise his father's apparent lethargy and apathetic will. In his eyes, his eyes of fire, he could scarcely see his parents now as anything other than what he had inadvertently made them into, his redundant pawns. However, his grandfather was not so unwise. Understanding the gravity of the storm which he had helped his firstborn son to unleash, and seeing that its fire had grown beyond what even his formidable powers could assuage, Tsar, Cain, and Lulal convened to work out a way to put down their apostate weapon. They found none. None within any of their powers, at any rate. So they formulated an alternative strategy. If they could not defeat Varkalak directly, then they would contrive a force too great, a wall too sturdy for even him to break down. But time was against them. Ten years had been enough for them to see the end nearing and to conceive the first of many solutions, whom they named Yurtel. But they had no time for long games, no time for study, for teaching. So instead, when their first son came for them, they abandoned their second at only the end of his first decade of life to the harsh tutelage of the draconian wildlands. This grueling trial by fire would brand and shape and test the avenging fireborn in ways that his parents' guidance never could. Their retribution would come swiftly, at the end of their favorite killer's favorite weapon, his own two hands. From his father's corpse, Varkalak took the tenth and final of his lasting gifts, a small golden amber stone which Lulal had given him after their son's departure to remind him of all they had not yet lost. Varkalak's hand would eventually be stayed by that of his younger brother centuries later in what historical legends retell as the Dragonomachy. But that is a tale for another time.